Uh, sure hope you're doing well. Welcome to those who are watching online. We're glad you're part of us as well. Uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer, then I'll share with you what's on, my, what's on my heart. Lord, thank you so much for the beauty of the day and the beauty of these folks. Thank you for uh, the honor of gathering under your name this morning. And uh, Lord, our prayer is the same every week at this moment, and it's this. We just want to be more like you uh, and how we love other people, how we uh, love our families, how we see ourselves. We just want to be more like you, how we forgive ourselves, forgive other people, Lord. We want to be more like you. So some of us in this room, this is going to be a major overhaul where you're, you're making things completely new in, in our hearts and lives. For some of us this morning, it'll be just kind of a tweak or an adjustment to something going on in our lives or an attitude or motive that's being formed or whatever. Um, but when we leave today, my prayer is that we would have crystal clarity on what you're touching to make us more like you. And so hide me deep in your cross, I pray, and may we all leave here incredibly impressed with God. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, this is a value series, and I, I love doing the value series. We do them, we've done them every year for the last three or four years, I guess, uh, here. And um, so uh, there's a reason we do that, and it's simply this. I just don't want anybody to be surprised. I don't want you to be surprised if you're brand new, if you're just visiting, or if you just started checking things out. I kind of want to be up front with you. Sometimes people attend a church based purely on a Sunday morning experience. So they'll come in, they'll sit in a room like this, and they'll think, wow, that was great. That's my church. I love that church. And they'll say, wow, the worship was good, the coffee's my brew, and the seats are really padded. You know, all these things. I like the personality. Whatever it is, I really like this, and that's why we go to the church. And then if you just ask them one more question, what does your church believe? And they have no idea. They don't even know what, what a church believes or why they attend that. And then you go further. What's the church teaching your children? Uh, you know, no idea. And so as a church, it's kind of important for us to say, this is kind of what we believe. And so for us, for, for this church, what we're teaching our children, all that kind of stuff, that has to do with these core values. Every church has this set of core values. Some of them are declared. Some of them aren't. Um, and Alive is no different. We have a set of core values that drive everything that happened in this church. And the reason we cling so deeply to these values is it's our deepest conviction that these values are what God says leads to an abundant life or life to the full. So as your friend, as your brother or whatever, I mean, we come together and we meet and say, hey, Tom, why should I be part of Alive? Well, as near as I can tell, we're doing the best we can on this pursuit of seeing what God what God says is the abundant life. And so if that's true, if God says that, naturally what we hope is not only will these values be part of our church, but we naturally hope these values will be part of your life and my life. So when you look at Tom and he's doing life in community, I look at you, you're doing life in community, ideally we'll see, wow, you know the values we talk about in life? I see that in Tom's life. I see that in your life. And because that's life, that, those are the values that lead life to the full. And so this morning, I think they put these stickers in your, in your programs. If you didn't get one, you should get a program or you get a sticker on the way out. And there's actually directions on how to put these on your car. And I thought, who needs directions, right? <laughs> and then I tried to put it on my car <laughs> and I went and found the directions <laughs> because these are not a normal sticker. So anyway, uh, these, these are stickers. And there are a couple things why we're handing this out in the beginning of the core value series. It's this. So when I get doing life, and I'm in a difficult spot, or maybe I'm having a rough day, maybe I'm, I'm struggling with identity, whatever, I don't know, you know how it is, just normal life, and I'm going through life, and then I pull up behind you at a stoplight. Bam, there's that sticker. And so here's what we're saying with this, is we're saying, man, you know, I'm pursuing those values as well. And so we want, if you, if you, if you agree with these, stick them on your car, and then you realize you're not alone as you try to live out these values. Now, just a couple of warnings that come from my personal experience after sticking the sticker on my car. One, when you're in the car rider line, and the person in front of you is taking 14 hours to unload little Susie or little Johnny, and you're tempted to blow the horn, look for the sticker. <laughs> look for the sticker. Or if you're going through Central, say, or somewhere, and you're at a stoplight, the light turns green, and the person doesn't go because they're on their phone, and you want to bless them with one finger or two, if you want to do that, look for the sticker. Look for the sticker, because you may see them again. Another thing I want to say is this. We have a lot of law enforcement personalities that go to our church. Sometime, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it will or not. I'm just saying that's just a possibility. But it has worked on more than one occasion. I just want to say, uh, just kidding. I'm just kidding. So here, here's what we're saying. Here's their whole deal with the sticker. It's basically this. 
What we're saying when we slap a sticker on our cars is the values of a life are becoming the values of my life. The values of a life are becoming and will become the values of my life. And so when we start doing life together and you pull up behind me and I pull up behind you and we see each other, it's kind of that fist bump without actually hanging your fist out the window. <laughs> it's like, hey, yeah, I get you. You get me. Here's some things about us. So that's what that's all about. Now, now this is a pretty arrogant or presumptuous statement for church to say. For you to come into this room and for me to suggest, hey, you got to make these values part of your life is pretty arrogant or presumptuous unless these values are undeniably true. If the values are undeniably true, unless those values legit lead to an abundant life, full life, then it's not arrogant at all. It's just truth. So the values we're going to hear in this series based on Psalm 23 are, are hills that the alive community will actually die on. These are kind of who we are. So with that kind of introduction, let me kind of give you just a few words of guidance as we begin the series. First one, of this, first one I want to say is this. One of the key phrases that Jesus would use when he began his teaching, he'd sit down in front of a crowd of people and he'd begin teaching, he'd say something like this, repent for the kingdom of God is near or the kingdom of God is at hand. He would say that all the time. Now, repent means to turn, and as we've talked about in our, in, our, in our culture, in our community, we say repent means to rethink how I think about everything. And so let me just put this into context. Um, these words that Jesus was getting ready to say that he's known for um, were significant because what Jesus is saying was this, because I am now available to everybody to be in you and around you, you might want to rethink your strategy for life. In other words, Jesus is saying, this is a difference maker. And if you're looking for an abundant life, if you're looking for life to the full, Jesus is saying, you, you might want to repent. You should repent and rethink how you think about everything. And so that's what we're going to do in this series. We're going to look at these six values that we think are clearly from Scripture, and we're going to lay them beside what's currently going on in our lives. And if there is a disconnect somewhere along the way, if one of these values isn't really part of our lives, well, we believe them to be true, then you have to ask the question, do I need to repent? Do I need to rethink how I think about this? Second thing I want to say as we head into this series is this. These are not original to alive. The, the values you're going to hear in this series, they are they are crammed in Scripture, from the Old into the New Testament. In fact, this whole series is based on an Old Testament passage. These are all through the pages of Scripture, so you can be sure that it's not something we went like to a mountaintop and got like a burning bush or a lightning bolt or something that spoke to us or an email. None of that. That's not really what happened. What really happened was these are just in the pages of Scripture. And so we're going to teach them from the pages of Scripture to you, to your children, to the students that are part of our youth program, all that kind of stuff. One last point. Have you noticed how many weird people come to our church? If you haven't, take a moment and look around the room. Go ahead, do it. Don't point, because that's rude. But just look around the room and say, wow, he's right. That dude is weird. Or that, you know, just look around. That's fine, okay? This, this is a great church. Now, now, here's the thing. We're a church of a whole lot of different people with a whole lot of different backgrounds. Here's an aha moment for you. Not everybody grew up like you did. <laughs> in fact, we're in a room full of people that probably grew up 14 different ways. Some of us in this room have been well-churched. I mean, we were there every time the doors were open. Some of us have been de-churched. We got stuck, but now we thankfully have made some steps away. Some of us are church-resistant. Some of us are church-disinterested. And yet, we're all here. We're all here. Some of you are going to hear this series, and you're going to think, dude, this is it. This is going to be our church home. This is exactly what our family needs. This is what I need as a single adult. This is what I need as I'm in my marriage, whatever. You think this is going to be where, where I'm going to be. And if that's you, great. Welcome. I mean, I'm so glad you're joining the body and you're going to run after these values with this church. That's fantastic. We aren't perfect, but we all are headed the same direction. Some of you are going to hear these values and you're going to say, you know what? I'm out. I'm out. And that's also okay. It really is. But, but if you leave, at least you'll be making an informed decision as to why you're leaving. At least it won't be, ah, I didn't like this, or I didn't like the whatever. It'll be, yeah, this church believes this, and, and, and I don't. One church doesn't fit all, and that's, that's okay. That's a good thing. You and I can still be friends. You don't have to avoid me at Walmart 
or me avoid you. We can still walk up. And if I ask, hey, how do you like church? <laughs> I don't. I'm not there anymore. That's fine, okay? I'll recover. That's okay. That's going to be fine. I'll recover. What a life has to do is this. We have to speak the words of life. It's not a consumer-driven model. We have to speak the words of life. This is what his being his bride means, what being the body of Christ means, what being a church means. And we have to speak these words even when it's not popular in culture or even when culture calls Jesus narrow-minded. We still have to speak these words. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's the business of what a church does. That's what we're supposed to do. Teach the words of life. And you may find yourself struggling with some of what you hear. So, so let, me just, let me just throw this option out there on the table for you. Even, you can belong here even if you don't believe everything. That's right. This isn't like a whole group think kind of thing in this room. That's not what's happening. And the reason I can say you can belong here even if you don't believe everything is this. Faith is actually a bunch of events that happen along a journey. It's not like one moment we all ate the cookie and then we all believe the same way. That's not what happens. It's a journey. And we begin this and other kinds of things happen. So here's, here's my commitment to you. We'll keep teaching the core values. And then we'll allow the mercy, grace, and conviction of the Holy Spirit to work in all of our lives. Um, but as we begin, just remember the motivation. This is what Scripture says. This is what we believe is the way to life and life to its full. And that's what this church needs to teach. And that's what we desire for you, for me, for our families. So, with all of those kind of guardrails, if you will, let me jump into Psalm 23 with you, which is going to be the basis for this entire series. It's probably one of the most famous psalms you've ever heard, or at least you probably know one or two of the clauses from this psalm. It was written by David long before he was any kind of dude in Israel's history. He was just a shepherd boy, and this is his first, word, first part of that, of that psalm. Psalm 23, you can read it for yourself in Scripture on your little phone thing, whatever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Now let's talk about just that. Have you noticed anything about this verse? Hopefully it's the part I highlighted in yellow for you to see with an arrow pointing to it. Okay, I did everything but point the arrow. Yeah, I want you to notice the word Lord here. This is kind of a big deal. Um, hopefully when you see that word Lord, you might think, wow, that, that's a typo, but it's not. That's actually not a typo. In fact, when you're reading your scripture, you will often come across, most of the time, in your scripture a place where Lord is spelled in all caps. And whenever you see the word Lord spelled in all caps, that's the Hebrew word for God that is the highest name of God that they have. It's the bomb diggity of God names, okay? It is, it is the big deal, okay? That's what, that's what all caps Lord is. And we actually have the story for where this word came from. So uh, Moses is uh, watching sheep or something, and he looks up on the side of a mountain, and there's a bush that does not burn up, but it's on fire. So he says, oh, I must go investigate that, because that's how you talked in the Bible. And so they went over there, and they look at the burning bush, and a voice in the bush speaks to him. Now, if you say, Tom, that's freaky, yeah, this is freaky zone, okay? This is weird. It doesn't happen every day. So he goes there, and a voice says, take your sandals off. You're standing on holy ground, which he does. A whole lot of weird things happen, but essentially what the voice in the bush is saying to him, the voice is God, and the voice is saying, hey, um, I want you to go to Egypt to deliver my people out of Egyptian slavery. And Moses is like, I'm guessing, okay, where are the tanks? <laughs> you know, where are the rockets or whatever? Uh, but basically he says, uh, how am I going to do that? And so he asks, he says, who, he's asking for who's in charge. He says, who do I say is sending me? And the voice in, in the bush, which was God, answers that question. He says, who, here's who you tell Pharaoh is sending you. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, I am is these four Hebrew consonants, a Y-H and W-H. It's sometimes called the tetragrammaton. You want to say it with me? One, two, three. Now, tetra means four. Grammaton was a character in the Transformer movies. I don't know if you all saw him or not. <laughs> He's in there. So this means four characters in the Transformer movies. And so that's kind of where that came from, I'm pretty sure. So you can use that. Uh, but then they would use these vowel or these breathing marks here because there, there weren't any vowels, just consonants. And this is where we got the word Yahweh or the word Jehovah. 
So anytime you see in Scripture, Lord, all caps, this is the word they're talking about, Yahweh or Jehovah. Now, this name for God, and this is going to be so foreign to us in our culture because we're all about Jesus being friend and all that. But this name for God was considered so holy that some circles, the word wasn't even pronounced. You know that whole Voldemort thing, he who should not be named? She stole that from the Bible. Okay, there are some things that you don't say, and this would have been one of those names. You wouldn't have said it when you were reading it publicly. Here's something else. When they were copying the scripture, the scribes, there had to be a cleansing ritual before they wrote the name for God, Yahweh. And not just that, some circles, some scribes, when they were copying the, the scripture down, whenever they wrote the name for God, they would have to use a different quill. They could never reuse that thing again. Their sense of reverence and awe for this name for God was so great or so extreme, you couldn't even express it or describe it in words. That, that's ineffable. That's kind of what that name was. It was such a level of respect and awe and holy, holiness res- associated with it that you, you couldn't even describe it in words and you almost wouldn't dare say it. And if you ever said it, you said it in hushed tone. That's this word, all caps. Because Yahweh described the almighty, all-powerful God who spoke to Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, who used Moses to deliver the people out of Egypt and who eventually would appoint and anoint King David to rule. That word for God, Lord, all caps, is the one used in our psalm. I am. There's a whole lot of great deal of study on that. I am business about what it means. Um, and, and it's really kind of probably be a whole series, but I don't know if anybody would come to it. <laughs> but um, kind of just three quick things. One, I think it refers to God's self-sufficiency. And what that means is he doesn't need anything else to define himself. Uh, you know, you can define God with just God. I am that kind of thing, if that makes any sense. Um, a little bit of this in Revelation chapter one. We've heard this before. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's that idea. Another, another kind of reason people often give for what I am means refers to the way that he provides for his people. Not only is he self-sufficient, but I am is all we need. So I am redeemer, faithful, covenant-keeping God. I, I was trying to find a way to explain this to you, so I found this on an old English manuscript which was in Google, which I searched, and there it was. Okay, so that's kind of, so I'll just read it for you, though, just to share with you. I think it puts it in some, some good words. Let me tell you how he treats me now. He supplies all my wants. He gives me more than I dare ask. He anticipates my every need. He begs me, ask for more. He never reminds me of my past ingratitude. He never rebukes me for my past follies. Here's the part I really love. Let me tell you further what I think of him. He is as good as he is great. His love is as ardent as it is true. He is as lavish in his promises as he is faithful in keeping them. He is as jealous of my love as he is deserving of it. I am in all things his debtor, but he bids me call him friend. That's what what he's talking about, what he provides for us. I am. I am as self-sustaining, self-sufficient. I am as all that we need. And finally, I think the I am reference, just for our purposes, references how consistent God is for t- over time. It wasn't, it's not, I was. It's not, I will be. It's I am. But Tom, you, what's the answer to my past? I am. You English teachers are going to have a stroke right now, but that's okay, just get over it. What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the issue for my present? I am. But what about my future? I am. I am. And that's kind of what's tied up in this. I'm faithful to my people when they reject me. I'm faithful to you when you accept me. I'm faithful to you in the present. I'll be faithful in the future. I'll be faithful in your past. I'm faithful to your fathers and mothers in the past. I'm always faithful. That's who I am. So anytime you log on to Lord, all caps, that's all that's behind those four little words, those four little letters. I am self-sufficient, provide all you need, And I am always current and always available to you. I am who I am. I am God. I am sovereign. I am almighty. I am ruler over everything. And this name for God is what the little shepherd boy David uses in this psalm. Get this. Long before he ever realizes he'll become a king or a ruler. Long before he ever takes a stone to Goliath and drops him. Drops him like he's hot. Okay, but anyway, long before that. Long before that, I'm sorry. Long before that, 
long before he ever gathers all the riches that was needed, were needed for his son Solomon to build the temple. Long before that, David is a shepherd boy. All he knows of God in this moment in his life is this. God is I am. And I am is all he needs. Isn't that kind of encouraging to you? Say, yeah, Tom. Because you all look so grumpy. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's a happy place. It's true. He is all you need. He is. There's another word I want you to notice. See if you can pick up on it this time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. It's shepherd. That's what I want you to notice. This is actually, it's in the verb form. So you could translate this. The Lord shepherds me. Which is kind of a cool idea to think about. This is a big truth. So let me, let me take you. The Lord... All caps, tetragrammaton, Yahweh, the most powerful being in the universe, the ineffable one, feeds, provides, cares, heals, protects, redeems, restores, forgives me, and he associates me and shepherds me. How about that? That's who this God is. And it's not just like professional Christians. It's all of us, right? It's all of us that he does that for, which is amazing. The great I am, the commander of the universe, the Lord Yahweh Jehovah leads me and I follow him. Now watch this. Do you know what the result of him shepherding me is? The rest of the psalm, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Green pastures are like a metaphor for security and safety. Quiet waters would be this place of rest and refreshment. So the shepherd provides and protects the sheep and leads them to the best life, to still waters. So let me paraphrase. The most powerful, all-knowing, unstoppable, most loving being in the universe loves me. And he will show me where my life will thrive and lead me down paths of life and blessing, joy and goodness. And if I am willing to follow the Lord, get this, I shall not be found wanting, incomplete, or insufficient. So this entire psalm, this entire truth rests on this one word in my paraphrase. If David is willing to follow the shepherd, to follow the Lord, quiet waters, calm pastures, green pastures. God may have this amazing plan for our lives, but it doesn't matter if we're not willing to follow it. That's just the truth. I'm sorry if that hurts a little, but it's just the truth. Uh, Sheep need a shepherd. I don't know if you all know this, but like I got like, we lived a, like moved to a farm like a year ago, so I'm like an expert now. <laughs> Write this down. Sheep are not smart animals. They dumb. They dumb. I mean, that's, that, that's what sheep are. They don't, they don't do well on their own. They get lost. They get attacked. They get stuck in holes or thorns. They're not very bright. And you know what? You know what the Bible most often refers to us when it comes to animals as? All y'all a bunch of sheep. That's right. Turn to your neighbor. You a sheep. Go ahead. Tell him. Say, you sheep. Make sure you say sheep, okay? That's important. Put the P on the end. You're the sheep. I don't don't think it's a compliment, guys. Uh, Nobody ever says, I want to be strong as a sheep, Dad. (laughs) Uh, nobody ever says, I'm going to be smart as a sheep when I graduate. Play with the basketball, son. You're never going to graduate. You know, that, 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 but, but sheep, sheep with a good shepherd never want. Now, here's the beauty of Scripture. Over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, now you're ready to hear the truth that Jesus taught and what he meant by it when he said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So how are we supposed to know the shepherd? 
how, how are we supposed to know exactly what's involved with this shepherd, this whole Lord, capitals, Yahweh, Jehovah, Adonai? Where, how are we supposed to know that? If this good shepherd leads me to green pastures and quiet waters. And now you're ready to hear the first core value of this church. We call it biblical authority. And this is what it means. We believe the Bible is God's word, and he'll show us the right way to live if we're willing to put ourselves under its authority and adjust our lives to what God said is right, true, and best. It's a core value in this church. And at times that's comfortable, at times it's uncomfortable. What I'm trying to say to you is scripture has authority in this church and in many of our lives, scripture has authority. What that means is, if I'm reading along and Scripture says something I don't agree with, I'm the one who's wrong. Scripture has that authority. It's something we hold up to the value because, because, listen, if we don't allow the Scripture to have authority, then what's going to happen is, and you can see this, God becomes an opinion swap. And everybody's got these opinions about God However, if we have a Lord, the Lord, all caps, if the Lord has authority and the authority by definition has the right to tell me what to do, to tell me what is best. That's what I mean. So if I'm going through life and I'm having a struggle in a relationship and what I'm doing is different or counter to what scripture says, I'm the one who's wrong. It has authority. If I'm struggling with self-esteem because I see myself in a poor light consistently because I never should have or I never would have, and I feel that and I live with it in my mind, and Scripture says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I'm the one who's wrong because the Scripture has authority. If I've been deeply wounded by someone, legit wounded, hurt, deep, and I'm spending my entire life building that bridge or or building that wall against that person and being bitter toward that person. And Scripture says you're supposed to forgive your neighbor, forgive your brother, or else you won't be forgiven. I'm the one who's wrong because the Scripture has authority. Jesus, who is revealed in Scripture, is my Lord, all caps. And what that means is He has authority. He's the commander of my life. And I am under his authority on this side of my funeral and on the other side of my funeral. Which leads to this big question for me. If I'm going to follow this guy and I'm going to place myself under his authority, how do I know he's a good commander? How do I know it's not some cultural thing that we've all bought into? How do I know it's worth it? Because there are a lot of options out there for me and for you. How do I know this is the one? So uh, Lisa's out of town this week. She was out of town. She's traveling. And so uh, she left Monday afternoon. I was texting Thomas by like Monday afternoon and one minute later and said, uh, Hey, Thomas, mom's out of town. You want to watch a war movie? That's kind of how we do it at our house because uh, we like those kinds of movies um, because there's nothing better than some good bloodshed. And so that's kind of, kind of what we do. So when Lisa's gone, we can kind of watch some of those movies, and that's kind of an exciting thing for us, and, and we just love it. And so uh, here, here's the thing. When I'm watching a movie like that with Lisa, so like I'm eating popcorn and like have a Pepsi or something like that and just enjoying my life, you know, kind of moment. And like, oh, <laughs> someone's head got blown off. I'm just kidding. I don't watch those. But anyway, you kind of, kind of see that. But she's over there. She's got a hoodie over her head and a blanket. And she's all cringed up like that. And her neck is so tense. And I say to her, she's the smartest woman I know. And I say, hun, <clears throat> that's not real. On that screen, that's all entertainment. That guy's head didn't really get blown off. That's not what happened. It's just entertaining. It's sick, but it's just entertaining. That's what that is. But she cannot make that connection like that. So for her to watch a movie, it's like working out the gym for an hour and a half, right? For me, I just sit there and get bigger. But that's kind of, that's kind of the thing. So on Monday, we decided, Thomas and I decided we'd watch a movie called Act of Valor. This is not a public Support of the movie, blah, 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 blah. So I wanted to see it because the movie, the movie uses real Navy SEALs in the movie. And so like they were actually the acting. And not only that, but I'd read that the U.S. Navy and the Navy SEALs organization 
actually cooperated in producing the movie, and what they said was this was the most realistic as far as to how their, how their uh, little things they do, missions, are played out. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. I did some reading about the movies, and the directors who hung out with the Navy SEALs were actually in awe of the movie and the stories of the Navy SEALs. And here's a quote from one of the directors that I thought I'd share. In what other group would someone take a bullet to save their brothers? I mean, that's just that's mind-blowing stuff other than Hollywood. But where does that even happen? Well, it did actually happen to these guys. And those stories helped define the brotherhood for us. So in the movie, The Act of Valor, it's not all one true story. It's, a, it's compiled from a whole bunch of stories of these Navy SEALs. The way I heard about it is one of the Navy SEALs in there who was acting is a believer. He lives out in Colorado, and he does some speaking and all that kind of stuff, but I heard about it th- through him. So in the movie, one of the leaders of SEAL Team 7 is named Lieutenant Rourke, and Lieutenant Rourke is leading his group through this, this building to try to get to release a hostage kind of thing, and some, the, the, bad, the bad dudes throw a grenade, and Rourke does a, he, he falls on the grenade, and it t- he loses his life. Now, for those of you that are mad that I just ruined the movie, it came out in 2012, people, okay? That was six years ago. You've been on Netflix since then, okay? It's too late. It's too late. We can talk about it now. You can imagine, though, the dramatic moment as the reality dawns on the squad that is following their leader. They're going through this little building and all this kind of stuff. The grenade's thrown, and there's a holler out there's a grenade, and Rourke just reacts, and he jumps on it, and as a result, he saves his team, and then he allows the mission to be accomplished. Now, what do you call a guy who does that? I mean, there are all kinds of things, you know, kind of descriptors. Heroic, of course. Courageous. Inspiring. Incredible leader. So let's say that Hollywood actually put the Hollywood to it. And let's say Lieutenant Rourke wasn't killed when he jumped on the grenade. But somehow he falls on a grenade. He goes, oh, that didn't hurt. And then he goes on. Let's say that kind of happens. Let me ask you this. Do you think there would be one Navy SEAL in his squad who wouldn't follow that leader anywhere? Are you tracking with me? Do you think there'd be one dude on that squad or that dude who on a squad who would say, hey, uh, you, you're going that way? I'm not going that way. After seeing what he was willing to do to protect his squad and accomplish the mission, do you think there'd be one person who would bail knowing that he was willing to give it all? <laughs> What do you call a commander who takes that hit even though they're the least deserving of the hit? What do you call a leader who is actually willing to put their life on the line so that the entire team could have their lives? What do you call a leader who lays down his life for others and then rises from the dead? How about Lord? How about Almighty? How about Yahweh, Adonai, Jehovah? How about that? David knew the shepherd is the Lord, all caps. And that value number one is biblical authority. The Bible will be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path in this place. It will lead us to green pastures if we are willing to follow the leader. Regardless of political correctness or changing culture or narrow-minded accusations, if we as a church let biblical authority go, this becomes an opinion swap and we have nothing left other than to argue who can argue the best. And that's not where we want to go. We are blessed in our community to have an incredible amount of churches that continue to cling to this value. And yet in Christian culture around our country and around the world, this one is under attack. It's under attack. And you actually have the option. Even now, you could walk right out of this building and into another one where biblical authority is not one of their values. But hear me on this. At some point, you will find yourself in a gathering that looks and smells like a church. And you will notice things being taught counter to what the Bible teaches. And a realization will dawn on you. Jesus is no longer Lord of his people in this place. And I know, because many of you who have joined this place came from a situation like that. 
And as scary as that realization would be for you and to know what your kids are being taught and your marriages are being taught, you as an individual could come to the exact same point and you will realize Jesus is no longer Lord for you. Yahweh, not friend, not buddy. Yahweh, reverent, Adonai, Jehovah God Almighty. You'll read something in Scripture, something that God says related to how we're supposed to do marriage, and you'll say, I'm not going to do that. He's no longer Lord. You read something that it says about sexuality, and say, I don't believe that. He's no longer Lord. How about this? You read something the Scriptures say about money, and you won't want to do that. Let's move on. No longer Lord. But if you read what he says about how God sees you, and you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you want that, Lord. There's a psalm, there's there's a little verse in a psalm uh, that says, God captures your tears in a bottle. Anybody out there grieving? Anybody out there hurting? That's this, Lord. But if you reject it, then he's no longer Lord. So let me ask you a question. When you think of what you understand about Scripture, what is the one area that causes tension in you when you hear God's Word says this or that? What is it that causes tension? Sex? Money? Forgiveness? Worry? What causes the tension? So I was thinking about that in my life and what was causing the tension, and I realized I think I have three options. Tom, do you think God is wrong? Well, for me, that option is not on the table. I I don't have any questions about whether or not he's God, for me. I know some people are still wrestling with that, but I don't think God's wrong. So then the next question was, well, Tom, do you think you know better than God? Honestly, sometimes. Am I right? No, but I'm too dumb to learn that. I'm a sheep, remember? How about this one? Because this is the one that I think I'm a Hall of Famer in. I know God's right. I just don't want his authority over my life. I know God's right, but I don't like things something tell me what to do. Well, if that's you, anywhere, any of those areas, if that's you, maybe it's time to repent. Maybe it's time to rethink how you think about everything. Because you have Yahweh, Jehovah, Adonai, God Almighty, all-powerful, the ineffable God, who is your shepherd and will lead you to paths or lead you to green pastures and quiet waters if you follow the shepherd. One of my friends, spiritual fathers, spiritual mentors, models this so greatly in his life. And I asked him if he'd be willing to share a little personal testimony about that. So if you would uh, turn your attention to the screen. I've always known the importance of the Bible, I think, since I was a kid. My dad was a Wesleyan pastor. Uh, His dad was a Wesleyan pastor. So I grew up in a culture of faith and trust in Scripture. I remember as a kid, we used to sing songs about the B-I-B-L-E. I I learned to spell almost with songs about the Bible's authority. So it's it's always been a part of my life. Uh, And... Uh, an important part because it's not just one of the things I believe it's foundational to everything I believe that's that's where that's where my understanding of God has been developed across the years is through the way that he's revealed himself to us in the scripture we live in a world that doesn't want truth to be absolute we live in a world that wants to redefine and uh, and reshape truth to to fit personal preferences. What if all of life were like that? 
What if we lived in a world without traffic lights or traffic laws? What would that be like if everybody got to decide what speed they wanted to go, uh, when they wanted to enter an intersection? Uh, we, we would pretty quickly say it's, it's not a safe way or a prudent way for us to live, and yet spiritually, that seems to be what people want. On a local, more personal level, I'm so glad that Alive does such a wonderful job of championing that truth and of presenting an unvarnished version of the truth Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. When Pastor Tom speaks or any member of the staff, what they preach is gonna be from God's Word. We can rely on it. Sadly, that's not always the case in every church. I'm so glad it's true here. And it, it makes this a place where people can find God safely because the God that they find will be the God who has revealed himself in Scripture.